Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this presentation. Um, I am, my name is Nicole Keith. I'm the Director of the Office of Diversity and Inclusion Management here at the Department of Civil Service. Um, I am pleased to be joined by two of my colleagues in the Staffing Services Division who are going to walk us through rewarding careers in public service and uh, kind of an overview of the civil service merit system. So um, I'll turn things over to them in just a minute, but as a quick reminder to anybody who may have joined in the past few minutes and haven't seen my um, message in the chat box. If you have any questions, send them to me in the chat box um, and we will do everything that we can to answer as many as we can um, before signing off today. Uh, so without further ado, I will turn things over to Darlene and Bridget. Um, and I'm looking forward to hearing what you all have to share with us. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Darlene Anderson, and I'm here with my colleague, Bridget Ariel. We work for the New York State Department of Civil Service, which is the Central Human Resources Agency for New York State. At the Department of Civil Service, we work with other state agencies to make sure they have the right people for the right jobs at the right time. This presentation will focus on employment in the executive branch of state government, which is comprised of 70 state agencies or organizations. And today we're here to tell you about working for the state, the exciting opportunities, rewarding benefits, and the process to become a New York State employee. So let's get started. There are a lot of reasons to work for New York State. Are you looking for a way to make a difference in the lives of others? Public service matters. As a state employee, you will join a diverse and dedicated workforce and play a vital role in providing essential services to the individuals of our great empire state. If you haven't yet thought of New York State as an employer of choice, let me give you some food for thought. Did you know that New York State hires people to work in the areas of environmental conservation, health and human services, and transportation, just to name a few? The state employs approximately 150,000 people in many different occupations, ranging from plow drivers to first responders, engineers, nurses, research scientists, and many more. New York State has opportunities and career paths for everyone, regardless of your education or experience. And also, if you are thinking of returning to state service, you may want to visit uh, Civil Services website for additional information. New York State is considered one employer, so once you're working for the state, you can transfer to other titles and agencies, and you have opportunities for promotion as well. While Albany is the home of our state government, did you know that more than 70% of positions are located outside the Albany area? The three most concentrated areas of employment outside of the Capital District are New York City, Buffalo, and the Syracuse and Binghamton region. New York State jobs also promote great work-life balance. We have flexible work schedules, world-class benefit packages, and other incentives that facilitate a high quality of life both in and out of the office. And state jobs pay better than you think. State salaries are competitive with the private sector. Plus, there are great health benefits that add to your total compensation package. Full-time employees of New York State may have federal direct loans forgiven after 10 years of public service through the Federal Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program. New Yorkers who have successfully qualified for and applied to the program have received an average of $61,402 in debt relief. We need new energetic and dynamic candidates to consider the state of New York as an employer of choice. New York State has positions in almost any career field you can think of, providing job opportunities for a broad range of backgrounds. Not a political science major, not a problem. There are state jobs suited to every interest and skill from art history to zoology. If you have minimum levels of education or experience and are interested in helping our most vulnerable citizens, New York State has opportunities for you. There are also a wide variety of entry level clerical and security positions. All of these positions require minimum education or experience. And once you're employed in these titles, you will receive the training to perform the job. If you have a degree in a particular area, like computer science, 
you may want to consider our information technology positions. New York State also has opportunity for those with professional certifications or licensing, including engineers, nurses, and also teachers. Like I said, New York State has opportunities for everyone. We strongly believe that the best workforce is a diverse workforce, and we actively seek qualified individuals interested in public service careers. So to understand how New York State positions are filled, you'll need to understand the different position classifications and the requirements to be considered for those positions. The first is our competitive class positions that make up 80% of the state workforce. These type of positions require that you take and pass a test and the hiring agency will use a list of passing candidates in score order to fill these positions. Most positions you will see are competitive like ITS, office assistant, or the recently announced labor services representative, which requires a bachelor's degree to qualify. We also have non-competitive class positions that make up about 15% of our state workforce. These positions do not require a written test, but there is an examination of your qualifications against the qualifications needed for positions, like for a mechanic position. And we also have the labor class positions that make up about 3% of our state workforce. Labor class does not mean you're working for the Department of Labor. These are labor positions used in a variety of agencies. They do not require a test. However, candidates must be physically able to perform the duties assigned, like for a cleaner position. We also have exempt class positions that make up about 2% of our state workforce. They do not require a test. These are positions that are appointed by the governor or the appointing authority and include positions like commissioners. So to recap, the type of positions determines how it is filled. For competitive positions, they require a written exam. Non-competitive, exempt, and labor positions do not. This is important to understand because the position type is listed on job vacancy postings that we will show you shortly. And by understanding this, you'll know what, to, what you will need to apply for the job. Because most of New York State positions are filled through competitive examination, we'll focus on this process. Looking for a job with the state is a bit different than looking for a job with the private sector. Approximately 80% of state jobs are filled by people who have taken exams. The exam and appointment process is made up of three main steps. Step one is the exam announcement. Step two is applying and qualifying for the exam. And step three is taking the exam. All exam announcements can be found online on the Department of Civil Service website, which is www dot cs for civil service dot ny for new york dot gov short for government you can also sign up on our website to receive email notifications when new exam announcements are issued make sure you sign up using your personal email address not just your work or school email or if you have more than one email address please be sure to sign up under all of your email addresses so that you never miss hearing about an opportunity to take an exam. On the screen, you will see the announcement for the Disaster Preparedness Assistant. You'll notice that all exam announcements have the same format, and it has all of the information you will need to, to apply. You'll see the exam title and salary, the exam date, the application deadline, the qualifications, the type of exam, and title information. We recommend that you print out a copy of the exam announcement to use when you are applying for the exam and preparing for the test. Just like you can get the exam announcement online, you can submit your application online too. Part of the exam process is reading the announcement completely thoroughly filling out your application to show that you meet the minimum, minimum qualifications for the exam and submitting your application before the deadline. Please be sure to follow the application instructions. 
an incomplete application could mean a missed job opportunity. If we need more information to review your application, we'll contact you. Otherwise, you'll receive instructions on how to take the test. So you've successfully applied. The next step is taking the exam. Exams are held based on recruitment needs. Most examinations are held periodically, like once a year or once every four years, and some are held on a continuous recruitment basis. This means that applications are accepted on an ongoing basis and passing candidates are added to the list continuously. So what should you candidates know about the different types of exams offered? Here are some examples of the types of exams we offer. Written exams are what most people probably think of as a state exam. They are held at various locations throughout the state, usually on Saturdays at local schools or colleges, and you need to bring a number two pencil to complete the bubble sheet with your correct answers. These tests are used for any title where there are certain skill sets that need to be tested. For example, written tests are used for Office Assistant 1 titles, and those candidates may be tested for areas like name and number checking and working with others. An evaluation of training and experience test doesn't feel like an exam because you are filling out a detailed questionnaire with your education and work experience but this is how you get your exam score. This type of test is used for titles to evaluate their experience after they've received the qualifications for the occupation, like teachers or social workers, or for exams like the newly announced Professional Careers Opportunities Exam, or PCO for short, to evaluate skill sets of those who have or will receive their bachelor's degree. We'll talk more about this exam shortly. A performance exam, on the other hand, is used to demonstrate that a candidate can reach a specific performance level, like a typing test. And lastly, an oral exam is used for positions like our lottery marketing representatives who have face-to-face -face communication with lottery retailers to market their products. The exam requires the candidate to show their ability to think on their feet, make sound judgments, and present ideas clearly and effectively. A proficiency test is used for positions where the primary function is to provide services in a language other than English. These positions have what's called a language parenthetic. The proficiency test will determine the candidate's ability to speak and or write in a particular language. There are three different levels of proficiency that may be needed based on the job requirements of the position. Level one test the ability to have simple routine conversations, provide basic information or assist customers to fill out a form or access services. For example, an office assistant one at a front desk. Level two test the ability to read and write in the language and have conversations explaining rules or regulations or discussing a problem. For example, a tax compliance representative in a call center answering or inquiring about delinquent tax bills. And level three tests for advanced proficiency. The candidates will need to have a relatively large and diverse vocabulary and, they'll, and the ability to explain complex rules, regulations, or procedures. For example, a psychiatrist or an LMSW. So what can you do to prepare for a civil service exam. On the exam announcement, there is a section called subject of examination. This section will inform you of the type of exam and a description of subject areas to be tested. You'll want to read these descriptions very carefully. In addition, if a test guide is available, it will be noted on the exam announcement and can be found on our website. How to take a written test guide will provide you with a lot of valuable information regarding the examination announcement and the application process. It will also provide you with good information on how to prepare for a written test and general test taking guidelines. Keep in mind for a test like the PCO, where there is no written test, a test guide is not available. You should read the subject of the exam to know what is being rated, view the online test in its entirety, 
and collect all the information you will need to complete the test. So now that you know a bit about position about how positions are filled, we'd like to highlight one of our feature exam programs for the PCO or professional career opportunities exam. Here's a quick video to give you an overview. Big jobs have a lot to offer. Competitive salaries, flexible schedules, and the benefits that are unmatched. So when I heard that there's a single exam that would make me eligible for nearly 200 jobs, I didn't hesitate to sign up. It's called the PCO, and it's not your traditional exam. There are no test times and absolutely nothing to study. You simply sign in and answer questions about your training, education, and experience. That's it. Don't let this opportunity pass you by. The deadline to sign up is November 30th. Visit cs.ny.gov slash PCO for more information. As the video mentioned, the PCO fills, fills nearly 200 different titles. If you have or will have a bachelor's degree or higher by June 30th, 2023, the PCO is one of the best ways to be considered for employment with New York State government. The PCO fills titles in a broad range of occupations in human services and training, service regulation and compliance, corrections and criminal justice, environment, natural and physical sciences, accounting, auditing, and finance, health and human services, communications, marketing, and public relations, transportation, administrative operations, economics, research, and statistics. And as mentioned, the PCO is now an evaluation of training and experience exam that doesn't really feel like an exam because you're filling out a detailed questionnaire online detailing your education and work experience. This is how you get your exam score. If you're interested, the deadline to apply for the 2022 PCO examination is November 30th, 2022. Once you apply, then the deadline to submit the online training and experience examination is December 15th, 2022. So, how do you apply? You visit the website www.cs.ny.gov forward slash PCO. You submit your online application by November 30th, 2022. You take the online test and submit by December 15th, 2022. And you complete and submit the PCO skills inventory by December 15th, 2022. As mentioned earlier, the PCO test is being administered as an online training and experience test. Online training and experience tests ask questions about your education, your training, and your work experience. This online questionnaire is your test, and the answers you provide to the questions will be used to rate and score your test. You must complete and submit the online questionnaire by the deadline in order for your responses to be scored. For the PCO test, you will be rated and scored in the following five areas. Analytical reasoning, customer and client service, professional relationships, reading comprehension, and written communication. Both general and select titles are filled from the PCO. All candidates who meet the minimum qualifications and pass the test will have their names included on the general eligible list. Select titles require specific education and experience. The way you show you have these qualifications is by filling out the skills inventory. So make sure you do this to be considered for the maximum number of titles you have qualifications for. And make sure to submit your test and the skills inventory questionnaire by December 15th. Once you have taken a civil service exam, the next question usually is, when will I receive my score? Generally, candidates receive their scores about 90 to 120 days after you take the exam. A passing score is 70. Candidates who pass an exam are placed on what is called an eligible list, which is what agencies can use when filling jobs. 
square notices will be sent to your email address. We cannot stress enough how important it is to keep your email address up to date. You can also view your score on the Eligible List Management System, or ELMS for short, online, which you can access from our website. The Department of Civil Service does not notify candidates when a list is expiring, so please make sure you sign up for the email notifications so you know when the next test will be held and can sign up again if need to. Now that you're on an eligible list, what should candidates know about the state's hiring process? The hiring agency will send what's called a canvas letter, either in an email or through the postal service to see who is interested in the position. The top of the canvas letter references availability for employment in a position in New York state government. And that's just what it is, a letter to gauge your interest and availability in the job and its location. It's not yet a job offer. The Canvas will give you information on that particular position, like name of the hiring agency, the title and salary of the position, the geographic location of the position, the type of appointment, whether it's permanent or temporary, the type of employment, whether it's full-time or part-time, and the date the Canvas letter must be returned. Make sure you respond to the Canvas by the deadline noted on the email or the letter so that you don't miss out on an opportunity. Also, make sure again that you keep your email address, your mailing address, and your contact information up to date. You may do this on Elms Online if you like. Otherwise, agencies may not be able to reach you about opportunities. So, now you've wowed them at the interview and you received a job offer. Congratulations. Once you've received an offer, you should receive an appointment letter from the hiring agency outlining the details of your appointment. And if you have any questions about that, you would call the hiring agency's HR office. So now that you know the exam and hiring process, let's talk about some of our featured programs. The first one is the governor's program to hire individuals and veterans with disabilities. This consists of two specialized programs that place individuals with disabilities in state jobs without taking a written exam. Positions normally filled through competitive examination can be filled through the appointment of qualified persons with disabilities. A formal application and medical evaluation may be required for certification. We also have the Veterans Temporary Hiring Program, which provi provides a centralized location for qualifying veterans to submit up-to-date employment, submit employment preferences, and upload a resume. The state uses qualified post 9-11 veterans to fill temporary vacancies rather than using temporary employment agencies. Opportunities exist in areas such as customer service, parks and recreation, construction and highway maintenance, and disaster response. And for college students interested in learning firsthand the value of a career in public service, the New York Leaders Student Intern Program provides students with access to hundreds of state government internships each year. This online process allows a student to submit an application, upload a resume, and select preferred internships. These internships are paid and unpaid and are available across the state and throughout the school year. The spring 2023 application period runs from October 1st, 2022 through December 22nd, 2022. So now that you understand the exam and hiring process, we want to give you some useful information that will help you with your career search. Please visit the Department of Civil Service website to obtain information on state examinations, and don't forget to sign up for email notifications. For more detailed information on the hiring process, you can also read the FAQs posted on our website. Another helpful link is the statejobs.ny website, which is a great resource to find New York State vacancy postings. Once you've taken an exam and are on, on an eligible list, check here for available job postings based on the titles you have tested for. 
You can also find non-competitive, labor class, and exempt jobs on this website. Once on the site, go to the area for the general public, click on the search vacancies to search for vacancies a variety of ways, including, you can include a keyword or simply put in a, a certain juris, uh, jurisdictional class, or you can search by geographic region. If you have any questions on how to obtain a state job, please do not hesitate to contact us. We are ready and willing to assist you throughout this process. Also, be sure to follow us on Twitter and like us on Facebook so you can be the first to know about exciting news and upcoming exams. When you work for New York State, you're not just making a living, you are making a difference. Whether it's protecting a vulnerable child, researching cures for diseases, or making our bridges safer, the work you do matters to your family, your neighbors, and to the 20 million residents of New York State. No matter what position you're serving in, you have the opportunity to make a difference and be a part of meaningful work. So this is the end of our presentation. Please feel free to ask us any questions that you may have. All right, uh, we have a couple questions right now. So definitely if anybody has any more, please use this as an opportunity to put them in the chat box. Um, but the first question we have is um, about minimum education requirements. Can you maybe talk a little bit about how people can find out what the minimum education requirements are for different jobs? Sure. The job posting will um, describe that it's an entirety. Um, it will have the position, it'll have the location, and there's a tab on our on state jobs. When you're actually in the um, posting, it will um, describe the minimum qualifications in entirety. So if it's something like open competitive, it's going to list all those open competitive um, qualifications. If it's a competitive um, title, it's going to advise that, and it's going to advise how one could qualify. If it's exempt, it's going to, again, advise how one would qualify, and the same for non-competitive. So the postings are very detailed. And the good thing about the posting is if you do have any questions, there's always contact information on that posting, whether it's a name and a phone number or an email. So if you ever have any questions about the qualifications, don't hesitate to reach out to that specific agency. Thank you. So the next question is, does the 90 to 120 day scoring for PCO begin on December 15th? Or is it the date that you complete your individual PCO test? It's going to be um, probably that the, the end date, excuse me. So, yes, once the exam is finished, then it does take approximately 90 to 20 days. And that is an average. Um, sometimes it may take a bit more, but yes, that'll be after the end of the exam date. Thank you. And how long do eligible lists stay active? Uh, and part B to this question, uh, how often would an applicant have to retake the PCO? Sure. Um, typically, uh, lists are good for four years. So, um, uh, unless a new exam is held, uh, typically the PCO is given every four years and lists are good for that duration. In the event that the exam is held sooner than four years, after a certain period of time, the old list will expire and the new list will um, take its place. All right. Uh, the next question it says, my understanding is you have to score 100% on the PCO exam. Given the new format, how is it possible to ensure that you get 100? Well, well that's a great question. Um, I'm not really, uh, as, the, as the exam is, um, how do I say? It's all going to depend on your education and experience. Obviously, um, we can't really um, tell the details here on how um, everything is rated and scored. Um, but depending on your length of education and your length of experience, there may be opportunities to get 100. My advice to everyone um, listening here is to be as detailed as possible. The PCO announcement does um, 
advise that you're going to want to have all your information readily available. So maybe the dates that you, you know, all your types of degrees, the dates that um, you graduated, all your experience, you're just going to want to be detailed as possible as you're um, answering um, all the questions on that exam. Thank you. Next question is, after applying, when do we take the exam? I applied, but there's nothing for the exam yet. I'm assuming they're speaking about the PCO. Bridget, would you like to answer this one? Sure. Um, so once you have applied, when you go back into that screen again, when you log back in with your personal NY.gov ID to where you applied, um, it is a little confusing for some folks. So it's it's been it's been a question we've getting a lot, and we certainly understand. Um, but what you'll see again is where it says application. It'll be number one um, again, where it says application. And then underneath that is where it will say um, exam is number two and the, the PCO skills inventory is number three. Those tabs should, once you've applied and paid for the exam, those tabs should be accessible for you. So you can start the exam at any time after that. You just have to go back to that page, click on number two to start the exam and you can start that process. So, I'm going to summarize this question, but is there guidance for people that might be completing the PCO and maybe coming up against some technical difficulties or getting an error message? Uh, is there any recommendations that you would have for them in terms of next steps? There is. If you can, um, it, on the PCO web page itself, um, there are a lot of great tips and there are there is an FAQ um, portion that you can um, that you can tap on. Um, some of the things as far as the technical issues depend on the browser that you're using. We don't suggest at all that you do it from your phone. Uh, we do suggest using a laptop or, or a computer um, to, to actually take the exam. Um, it, the browsers, you know, are, are some of the major ones are the ones that we recommend using Microsoft Edge or Google Chrome, those type of things. Um, but there are a couple other other tips on the website also. Um, you may have to clear your browser just because it's a lot of information, so that may help. Um, and then also on that PCO webpage, if you are having any issues um, that you can't figure out yourself, um, there is an uh, email that you can contact if you're having any trouble, and that email is just PCO at civil service, or excuse me, at CS for civil service. So it's PCO at CS dot ny dot gov and you can always email if you if you can't you know troubleshoot it yourself you can email that um, that inbox and we'll certainly take a look at it and try to help you out thank you um so when somebody's completing the pco exam if a degree is earned if it's going to be earned in the future is that the date that should be entered Yes, on the application section, you can you can fill in still if it's if it's a future date as long as it's going to be on or before that June thirtieth, twenty twenty three date. Got it. Thank you. Uh, somebody is asking about the different salary grades. Um, you know, what are the different salary grades, and how do they know what each level means? Certainly, why don't you do, take that one for me? Sure. So. Uh, it's all depending on the title and the position is how um, the salaries are classified. So if you have a question, the salaries are always going to be listed on every exam announcement unless um, um, like the PCO, um, there may be some different grades on there. So you may have uh, different um, salaries on there. And then on every job announcement, on every posting, excuse me, the salary is going to be listed. Thank you. So is the PCO program considered competitive? It is, it is. All, all the titles filled from the PCO are competitive. Folks are going in, they're applying for this examination, they're competing for an exam, they're taking a written exam in a training um, and experience format, but it is considered, a com all those titles are uh, filled by the PCO and all are considered competitive titles. 
Thank you. <clears throat> um, somebody asked if there is a way to filter what jobs have training included in them. I would say that any position that has a trainee title is going is if you look at the qualifications and look at the job uh, description, it will let you know there that is going to be um, it's going to be filtered traineeship. You may start as a trainee one or possibly a trainee two. And if you ever have any questions about a posting and want to know about the on the job training, you can always look through the posting and look through all the different you know description of the position. And again, you always have that phone number or email on each posting if you ever need more questions about that particular position. Thank you. Um, the next question is, what is the tenure track for civil service jobs in general? Um, well, that's a great question. So, um, depending on the position depends on um, when you when you get tenure. Um, so competitive competitive positions, um, you do gain tenure. Um, I'm just trying to think of anything else here. Um, it's a little more, it's a little more detailed. So it's not like what you would expect, like with teaching positions. So I encourage you to, um, uh, check our website and research a little bit more about tenure. And you can also always reach out to our PIO at civil service um, for more specific questions about tenure and a staffing representative will be more than happy to research that. But it also, it does depend on the position and the jurisdictional classification of the position on whether um, folks would gain tenure protection or not. Thank you. So how long does it usually take to hear back after being interviewed for a position? That's gonna depend on the agency. Again, those are going to be questions that you're going to want to direct to the agency when you're interviewed for the position. And then, you know, that would be a follow up that you would um, ask with the agency that's hiring. Thank you. And for those that are expiring on the previous PCO exam uh, or the previous list, is that score, so that previous score, is it upheld until the closing date of the new PCO? That list will be viable until the new list is established. So once the new list is established, after 30 days, that old list will expire and the new list will be, um, agencies will be able to hire off that new list. So if you're on the PCO right now, you're still okay. Um, and best of luck on the new one if you take it again. Um, somebody asked if you're able to share more information about the new leaders program. The new, leaders. the new leaders, the internship program or the, I'm so sorry. Nope, it says new leaders program. I think the new New York leaders program. So I think that would be the Oh, answer. the new leader. Um, well, we do have some information on our website. And not only that, um, if you do have some specific questions, I, I do encourage you to go onto our website and look. Um, there's a lot of detailed information on the New York leaders student intern program. And if those, if that website does not answer your questions, then by all means, please reach out to civil service. We have staffing representatives that oversee that internship program, and they'll be able to provide you some more um, assistance on your questions. There is an email on the bottom of that page also that you can contact directly for that. Oh, perfect, Bridget. Thank you. Yes, I see it right there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yes, it's right there for you. Uh, next question is, are there positions that are remote and how will candidates know if a position is remote? I believe the job usually just listed right in the, in the job posting. It'll say whether or not um, telecommuting is available um, and, and each agency decides, you know, what their, um, what their criteria is for that. But in general, it's, it's usually right in the, in the job posting itself. Um, and certainly something you can ask of, uh, you know, an HR, an agency's HR, if you're, if you're considering a position. All right, I'm going to merge 3 questions here. They're all kind of similar. <laughs> uh, <laughs> can you talk a little bit about how long the exam is, whether you have to complete the exam all in 1 sitting. And uh, if there's any impact on your score, if you complete the exam over multiple sittings. Bridget, do you want to answer those? Sure. Um, there's not 
really a, a great answer for the first one as far as how long it should take. Um, it really depends on, on, you know, how comfortable and how quickly you're going through it. Um, so you can take as long as you want. There's no time limit on the exam um, other than it having to be uh, submitted by December 15th. Um, but you can start it and save uh, where you're at um, and go back in and complete it at different times. There's no impact on your score whatsoever if you if you go in for multiple sessions to complete it. Um, it's just it's just scored you know on a whole, so it's it's not keeping track of how long it took you to to take the exam. Um, even once you you do take it, if you need to go in um, and just double check that you filled out part of it or or you thought of something else that you wanted to add, um, you're able to do that up until that December fifteenth, uh, twenty twenty two date. Great, thank you. Uh, do you need to be a New York resident to take the PCL? You do not need to be a New York resident to take the PCL. And do you have to wait for a score to apply for positions that are filled by the PCL? Yes, you will. As we had mentioned, um, you have to wait and get on an eligible list and then agencies will fill from that eligible list once they um, are ready to recruit for a specific title. Uh, can a tablet be used to complete the PCO? Bridget, do you want to handle this? Um, I don't rec I don't believe it's recommended, but Bridget, can you it's expand not, on it's that? It's not recommended. I mean, if that's what you what you have and you want to want to try it, you know, it, it's not necessarily going to hurt anything. Um, so it it. it may be okay for you. It, it really just depends on the, you know, the, the again, the browser that you're using and, and its capabilities. Um, so it, it's not something that we recommend, but it's not that you can't do it that way. And if I can actually add to that, if, um, you know, if access to computer equipment or Wi-Fi is an issue for anybody, contact us um, and we can put you in contact um, with entities like the uh, Department of Labor um, that can make arrangements for you to use equipment to make sure that you get this done. Uh, the next question is, how can you get a waiver on the exam fee? So there are a couple different, um, sorry, I'm just trying to get to where I can view what I want to say about it, but there are a couple different um, scenarios where the um, fee could be waived. Um, and so when you are applying, um, doing the application part of it, um, you can uh, look um, once you put the exam in um, and it, you know, it's asking you to verify some of the information. Um, there are those instances where you can check off where you may qualify for the, the fee waiver. Um, that is in the FAQ section on the PCO page. Um, if you're unemployed and primar primarily responsible for the support of a household, um, there's a, a box for that. If you are eligible for Medicaid or receiving supplemental Social Security payments or public assistance of, of any kind, um, as far as the temporary assistance for needy families or family assistance or the safety net assistance, um, or if you're a certified job training participant or partnership um, in uh, the investment act there, um, you may be eligible to, to select that part of it for the fee waiver. If you are a New York state CSCA representative employee applying for the open and competitive examination, um, that, uh, you can choose that option because they do, uh, they do cover your fee. And lastly, if you're a veteran discharged under honorable conditions from the armed forces, of the United States or New York State, and you're applying for that open and an open competitive exam, you can choose that as well. So, um, as you're filling out that application, they should it should there's a section that should show you that about having the uh, the fee waived, and those would be the four as of right now the four criteria that you choose from. Thank you. Uh, next question is: Can salaries be negotiated? Um, that's something that you would want to talk to the, um, the agency about. It's not a typical process. I will, I will say, um, 
but there are instances where it's appropriate and that's something that you would have to talk to the agency about. Um, I, I, know, I believe we answered this question, but I'll, I'll ask it again, um, just in case anybody signed on a little bit late. When completing the PCO written test, can it be stopped, saved, and completed at a later time? I'll just jump in and say yes. <laughs> <laughs> it is, and I would add yeah. that when you're going through, please make sure to, to save each section as you're doing it. Um, if you, there's, there's, if you if you try to go back um, without saving it, um, sometimes you will get a message depending on the page you're on. But if there's a save option, just save each one so that. Um, you're not stuck. And I know I also said that there's not a time limit on the test and that's true. There's not, there's not a time limit, but if you get up and walk away from your computer, um, or, you, you know, and you leave it for a certain amount of time, it will, it will eventually log you off. Also, I, I don't know if it's like 20 minutes or 30 minutes, but, you know, pretty much the same as, as anyone, if you get up and walk away from it, that part may time out. You can still go back in and redo it again. Um, but that way, if you saved it, you won't get stuck that way either. All right. Somebody wants to know if there's an age limit uh, when applying for positions. Not at all. Well, you know what? I, I do. I would always look at the exam announcement for, and sometimes there are requirements for like our university police officers um, and maybe other certain safety and health um, positions. So, I will definitely backtrack for <laughs> for most there's not an age limit, but for some there may be just due to um, the duties of the position. You're going to want to read every exam announcement very carefully and then look at the job posting as well. Thank you. Somebody wants to know that if you're hired and you're coming from another government job, will your time transfer into the state job? And that's a great question. Um, that's something that you want to discuss with the hiring agency. Um, it really, with a lot of things, that's always case by case basis. So you're going to want to discuss that with the hiring agency. Depending on the type of government agency you're coming from, um, it just may depend. So you're going to want to discuss that with the hiring agency and they'll look into that for you and, and make sure that you're aware of everything pr prior to accepting the position. And they'll be able to answer that for you. I think this next question will give the two of you an opportunity to take a sip of water because I think it's directed towards me without the <laughs> asker knowing it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so how, is, how is diversity in agencies accomplished through examinations? And what I will say about that is that New York State and the Department of Civil Service is committed to ensuring equity and uh, equity of opportunities for everybody, for all the diverse populations that exist throughout New York State. Um, and one of the things that we are um, adamant about doing is making sure that these opportunities, so exam opportunities and resources and guidance in terms of like how to navigate systems, like we're much like we're having right now, right, are, are made available to populations in historically underrepresented and traditionally underserved populations throughout the state. Because the more access that people have to exams, the more opportunities they will have to take advantage of um, employment opportunities. Um, and we have a very robust statewide diversity, equity, and inclusion program. Um, and we're, we're excited about it, we're passionate about it, and uh, we're very mindful of the role that exams and the role that access to exams have, or plays, I should say, in, um, in diversifying the state workforce and ensuring inclusion as well. All right. Um, can international students take the PCO? Great question. Bridget, do you know the answer to that question? Um, I do. It, you, you can. Um, there is a section again on the, um, I'm just trying to find it. I think it's on the FAQ portion, but I just want to double check. It is a question we get a lot. Um, there is there is what you have to do if you have a, a, a foreign degree, if you if your degree is not um, not from a, a university or a school in um, in the United States, if it's a foreign degree, there are companies that will um, you do have to to contact them and and pay a small fee for it. 
um, but there is there are companies that will give you an equivalency document um, that you would use, and it eventually it essentially says, you know, if your degree is equal to a bachelor's here in the United States or each equal to a master's degree, um, they will verify that, um, and you can um, you can note that in the application section again when you're filling out your type of degree, um, just in the uh, name of the school. And then you can put like a slash and put the company that you got the verification from and their address. Um, and then at the time of um, that'll allow you to, to go through and then apply and then and then take the exam. And then at the time of any interview that you have, you would be required to provide that document again, just to show that it's equivalent um, to whatever degree it is here in the United States. Thank you. Uh, we have a request uh, for you to discuss the skills portion of the test and how that works. If you can maybe talk a little bit about that. So the, the skills inventory piece of it, um, again, on the PCO webpage, um, there is uh, a list of all the job titles that the, um, that the exam is covering. And on that list, it will show you under the type of the title, whether it's a select title or if it's a generalist title. So again, the generalist title is covered by the exam itself. Um, and you don't have to necessarily fill out that skills inventory. But if you look at the skills inventory, if you have any thing that you can fill out for experience um, under that section, that will put you on the select title list for some of those titles that you would qualify for as well. Um, and so that's what that section of it's for. Um, you know, it's for anything just, you know, as a as a example, um, you know, if there's um, an accountant trainee um, that you're that you may want to be looking at because you um, because that's the area that you have your that your bachelor's degree is specifically in accounting or auditing or taxation, um, or that you have a certain number of semester hours that that are under that title that are required. That's what the select skills um, information. If you have that, that's where you would fill that out, and then it'll automatically put you on that list as well. So that's what that skills inventory piece is for. Is for um, anything that requires something more specific than just a bachelor's degree. Um, and again, on, the, on the, the job title list, if you click on any of the titles, it'll tell you specifically what they're expecting you to have for that select piece. Um, but in general, it, right on the front, it just tells you whether it's a select title or a generalist title. Thank you. And um, another question is, so say somebody has um, different types of experiences and, and skills and they're filling in the PCO, can they be canvassed for different types of positions? Like will they receive uh, canvas for admin positions and canvas uh, for accounting positions? It, it's certainly possible. Again, the, the, um, the one title would be a generalist title. Um, and then if they filled out that skills inventory and they qualify for an accountant title or something else, um, it's certainly um, certainly possible that they receive a wide variety of types of canvases. Um, so it, it really just depends on on you know what they what their experience and their and their training have qualified them for. Thank you. And uh, do candidates need to provide proof of their um, degree during the application process? No, when you're filling out the application process, you do need to fill in what type of degree you have and, and um, that information. But as far as, as actually providing the proof, that would be, again, if you're interviewing for a position, um, then you have to, to provide the degree uh, proof at that time. And let me just add to that and any additional transcripts. So if like Bridget said, if you're filling out the skills inventory and let's say you have, you indicate you have nine credits of accounting, taxation, auditing, or 12 or 24 or whatever, 
the case may be at the time of the interview, you will have to provide proof of the transcript as well. So somebody asked, is a perfect score of 100 the only way to get Canvas from the list? And will scoring for this exam be different than it's been in the past? The list, the list, um, um, the scoring be different? I'm not sure. I'm not sure what they mean by this, but I will say is um, the list is going to be quite large. As we know, the PCO is a very popular uh, title, however, or excuse me, a popular exam, but however, it really depends on um, the location, the different positions that an agency may have. They may be able to move through their hundreds pretty quick. Um, if you're already a state employee, there may be opportunity for transfer off of the PCO list. Again, um, when it comes to transfers, there's a lot of different variables. So um, if you ever have um, questions or concerns about your mobility, you know, you're on the PCO, but maybe you're not reachable, but you're currently in a competitive class title at the moment, we do encourage you to reach out to our career mobility uh, unit. They do, if you are a state employee, they do provide a specialized um, uh, employee plan. So they'll they'll look at your history and they'll give you guidance on career opportunities. So um, we do encourage you to reach out to them. I'm just gonna try to find their website real quick unless Bridget's found it. Um, I believe it was on this page. And if it's not, I will find it and I will, I will um, speak about it in just a moment. I will find the career mobility uh, website for you. So we're coming up on our time. So unfortunately, we're not gonna be able to answer all the questions. So I have a quick question before we introduce maybe our final question. Um, for people that have outstanding questions that we were not able to address today, should they email the email address on the screen right now? Absolutely, absolutely. If you have a specific yeah. question um, about anything you've heard today, please, by all means, contact us by that. Um, with that, email and then that'll filter through to the specific uh, section within um, staffing services to answer your question, whether it's in relate to an eligible list or more um, information on mobility within the state. Um, absolutely email our questions. We'll be, we'll be more than happy to answer you. A lot of our questions can be answered on cs.ny.gov. As Bridget talked about, there's an FAQ. There's, um, it discusses transfers, it discusses eligible lists, rules of three, reinstatement, um, different kinds of leaves if you're within um, the department, or excuse me, uh, within the state, working um, uh, you know, in a competitive class position, non-competitive, whatever the case may be. So we encourage you to visit our website. If the website does not answer your questions, please by all means reach out to us, we'd be more than happy to help you. I did want to let anybody that was interested to know the career mobility um, office, their address, the web um, site is cs.ny.gov forward slash CMO for career mobility office forward slash. They have a wealth of information as well and can provide you some guidance. And again, that's for state employees, current state employees. All right. And then. I will combine about 50 of the questions that came in <laughs> and just provide yes. <laughs> a, a very, uh, very sort of high level response to it. Cause there has been a lot of, uh, you know, demand for a uh, recording of this. Mm -hmm. I will say any uh, information that we have available, any videos, any recordings that we have available are going to be available on our YouTube page. So, um, not, yeah, yes, on our YouTube page. So I highly recommend if you are not subscribed that you subscribe to our YouTube page. So you see whenever anything is posted. Um, so if this recording becomes available or as other resources become available, you will be the first to know. Um, and with that, I would thank you all for your time. I think this was uh, incredible. Thank you, Darlene, and thank you, Bridget, for, um, you know, this. Somebody just said outstanding presentation. Couldn't have said it better myself, an outstanding presentation. And thank you, everybody, for thank all you. your questions. Thank you. And we weren't able to get to them all, but please uh, email us, and uh, we will do the very best we can to uh, answer all of your questions. So, uh, thank you and have a good rest of the afternoon. Thanks everybody. Bye, everyone.